Hey, so I just wanted to share a few tips with you about how to paint sunflowers in a field, just like these. So, let's get started. All right, so a few things that I wanted to talk about first, before we get to the sunflowers, is that this painting is a nine by 12 inch, so it's not real big, and it was painted all in one session, which is a la prima. <clears throat> uh, wet into wet, everything uh, from start to finish, the paint is still wet. So the principles that we'll discuss here, they will apply, even though this was done here in my studio, these principles apply whether you're painting plein air, out on location, or in the studio from photos or in a study or reference images. So let me show you the original reference image that I used right here. So this was out in Kansas where I was doing my MFA degree and we were surrounded by sunflower fields. I loved them. And the thing that really appealed to me about this image, and that's really one of the keys. In fact, let me get you so you can see me here. All right, there we go. So one of the keys to successful painting, at least uh, successfully accomplishing what you want to accomplish is to actually know what you want to accomplish. So I was not interested in an exact, exact replication of this painting, or of this photograph. That didn't appeal to me at all. But what I wanted was the feeling of it. The, so, and a lot of the, um, the interesting characteristics of these flowers. So like looking at this one right here, it's almost full face at us. And I love these little bright highlights on top and then these flicks of petals that just go off to the, the side there. And then we have this one over here that's kind of leaning down more. Uh, this one over here where we can see the stem curving around. It was things like that that really grabbed my heart and made, and made me think, yeah, I, I want to paint that. So <clears throat> knowing your why about something is going to help you to achieve the feeling and the expression that you're wanting to get with it. If all you do is think, oh, I want to paint sunflowers, but I'm not really sure why, maybe, well, probably because they're pretty, you know, that sort of thing, it's, you're going to be much more successful and guided by your, uh, your thoughts, your, your understanding, and that little still small voice that seems to speak to us a lot, um, that creative intelligence, if you really have a clear understanding of your why. So that why helped me to know that all of these grasses down here are kind of boring and they really don't add anything. They're not, they're not um, giving any kind of energy to the painting overall. And they don't help me to feel like, they're not guiding me to those flowers and I, they don't give me the feeling of, uh, of flowers out in a dusty field like I wanted to have in this. So I eliminate all, most of that. I use, now when I say that I eliminate most of that, when I look at something like these little strong pieces of grass coming up or something like that, there's a little blue uh, bit of, of grass bending over right there. I come over here and I see this right there that looks almost like a stalk of wheat or something. These grasses that are growing up and all the seed stuff is on there. Some of that I can use because it's interesting to look at. And it gives uh, little parts that I can use to break up the ground and uh, break up shapes. So really it's all about everything comes down to shapes and values and design. So if I can, if I can maintain the correct values and have an interesting design that leads the viewer around the painting and then concentrate on, on keeping everything in shapes, not here's a flower and I need to paint that flower just like a flower so everyone knows it's a flower. It doesn't really matter. It's the shapes that are important and the relationship of one shape to another shape that's important. But uh, today let's get to how I actually created these petals and was able to finish this painting in about two hours. Okay, so we'll move that over and here's, so what I did was I uh, marked out a few areas. This is one of the videos that we have in our membership library. Uh, and I marked out a few areas in here on the timeline that I 
to help you to see rather than going through this whole video, uh, which wouldn't be right anyway, um, I want to show you just the pedal areas in here. Okay, so this first part, if you notice, one of the, one of the keys to the way that I paint uh, is to not really draw anything in there. I don't start with any kind of drawing. Uh, to me, that, that is um, cramping my style. <laughs> it's getting in the way. It's creating boundaries that I don't want to have there. So I just start with big color areas like the transparent oxide red and transparent oxide yellow and maybe a little bit of um, like manganese blue mixed in there to give it variety as I put these um, big shapes of color on my canvas. And the, the, the surface that I painted on, to, uh, on this day just happened to be a linen, uh, a, the, a type of uh, lead primed linen is what it is. So I don't always paint on linen. I, actually, mostly I paint on ABS plastic, but that's for another day. So this, um, and this is my palette over here. Uh, all of my colors, if you're interested in what I'm painting with, I've got uh, titanium white, cadmium lemon, cad, cad yellow medium, cad orange, cad red light, cad red medium. And then these are the uh, oxide colors. So transparent oxide yellow, orange, and red. Quinacridone red, uh, alizarin crimson permanent. Uh, uh, ultramarine blue, uh, manganese blue, and then some phthalo green and, and sap green over here. Okay, so not all that's going to be important, but you might be curious what my palette is. Okay, so when I'm coming in, when I'm looking at this, photo, this uh, reference photograph here, the things that I'm, I squint down, even if I'm in my studio looking at a photograph, I'm still squinting at it so that I can I can judge the values and the shape relate the relationships of one shape to another. So I'm looking at how uh, the shapes are broken down into their relative values and how those values relate to one another. So very quickly, I determine where my dark patterns, where the, the patterns of the shadows are in my painting. And so I'm looking real quick as I look at it, I see that there's some darks over here, darks down in here, and all around this area, uh, near this flower over in this area right here over in this area then it starts to get lighter and less um, less color in it as I move away from the viewer out into the distance and you can see that there's not nearly as much contrast as far as the shadows under the leaves as there uh, is up here in the front so when I put in the shadows in this I've got them just quickly, just brush strokes of usually ultramarine blue, some lizard and crimson maybe, um, and some possibly transparent oxide uh, red or sap green mixed into it. Depends on if I'm going for a little bit cooler or warmer. Uh, so, and all of this is done very quickly, not really putting tremendous amounts of thought into, uh, like, especially placement. I'm not concerned about getting them placed exactly where they need to be uh, or anything like that. I'm getting approximations with all of this because for me, the beginning design like this is all about uh, fluidity. I want to be able to move. If I don't like where I've placed something, if I, if I get to a certain point and I think the design isn't quite working for me, it's, it's at this initial stage that I can get a good feeling for that. So I, I just put some things in quickly. I start to uh, get my placement and then I start coming in with more refining shapes. And I, I'm always thinking in terms of shapes, not in terms of um, I, I need to get this pedal in here and this pedal. I'm thinking of usually the pedals all as one bigger shape, not a bunch of little tiny ones. If I need to break up one bigger shape, I'll do that with, with something, but I try to maintain shapes in here, especially uh, when it comes to the values related to those shapes. Because I don't want to get, okay, I, I need to explain that real quick. So <laughs> when, when we're talking about a shape that's a particular value, when I'm squinting, I can see the overall value, whether it's darker, uh, middle value, or lighter. And then pretty much, as, uh, for the most part, the degrees within those light, middle, and dark. And so if I, uh, when I break it down into shapes like that, there might be, let's say we, we're, we have a rock and there's light bouncing on that rock, reflected light. Well, when I squint down, it helps me to eliminate that distraction. I don't want to get distracted by that reflected light. I want the overall 
uh, value of that shape. So whether it's the shadow part of that rock or the highlight part of that rock, I, I'm thinking of the highlight part as a shape and the shadow part as a shape, not as the rock, and not of the rock as a whole. So I've got the shadow shape, and within that shadow shape, I want to make sure that every little stroke I put in there matches the overall value of that shape. So in the so I won't come in there with with something that looks like it belongs in the light and put it into that shadow shape because then it it won't work because light isn't in shadow and shadow is not in light. Uh, and sometime I'll do a video that explains a little bit more in depth about that. Uh, okay, so here we go with some of the how I initially start putting in when I'm looking at this the middle part of the flower, the seed portion of those flowers. And you'll see that it goes fairly quickly. And for some reason it's frozen up on me. Okay, sorry about that. So this is a good point for me to, <laughs> a good place for me to point some things out. This initial color right here, when I come up into the, the seed pod areas uh, on the flowers that are closest to the viewer, I'm gonna darken that significantly. But as we go farther out, what I'm thinking of is two things. I wanna reduce the value uh, of those seed pod areas as they go farther away from the viewer. Uh, and I wanna reduce the, the chroma, the, the saturation of the color of those as well. Because the farther away they go, the less contrast we're going to have and the less strong color that we're going to have. Even though when we look at a field of sunflowers, it might look like they all are kind of the same color all the way through. They're not. And even if, they, even if there's some possibility that they are, we're going to create a much greater sense of depth in the painting if we can tweak that and start to gray down or uh, lessen the like lighten, if it's a dark value, darken that, or lighten that value. If it's a light value, darken that value as we go back in the distance. And then with color, we start to desaturate it. We start to make it um, possibly cooler, not necessarily. Uh, and generally, it's the same thing. If it's a bright, we darken it just a little bit. And if it's a dark, we lighten it a little bit as we go off into the distance. Okay, so let's see if this is gonna play for us. That might end up being something there. Well, I don't know what this is doing. Didn't do this to me earlier. So. Sorry about that. That's terrible. You know what? Let me get this fixed, and then I'll be right back. Okay, so now I'm going to start darkening Sunflowers the mix. beginning. So here's our one will start. Each of these I'll highlight a little bit and start to form out some of the individual sunflower shapes here. And then right up here we've got a big one. And as I need to, I can darken the value of some of the middle areas of these sunflowers. Okay, so you can see that with these, the middle part of it, I'm not going in there and noodling this. I'm taking, this is just a, a good sized bristle brush, like probably a size six or eight. And then I'm just putting in a basic shape there. It doesn't have to be exact because the way I paint it, it's, it's like David LaFell describes it, it's sculptural. I'm carving back into places that need to be refined or changed in any way. So I'm not worried about getting the exact shape right off the bat. I can modify that at any time throughout this. What I'm trying to get, do is get a good feeling for the overall placement of those shapes so that it gives me a nice variety as I'm going along, that I like the design of them and how they lead the viewer around through the painting. So right now it's really about how do I feel about this placement? I chose this uh, 
photograph because overall I like the design of where the individual sunflowers are. But if there's one sunflower in there that I think isn't in the right spot or something like that, I can easily change what's in the photograph and move it to wherever I want it to be. So I'm going for the feeling of it. And that's why all that stuff in the background is mostly just quick strokes of color that are put in there. And then on top of those, I'll come in with, with more layers. So let's go to, that should not have made noise. Sorry about that, I had that turned off. Now it is fully turned off. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so let's go to down here to 2758. All right, so now you've gotten an idea. As you can see here, just moving along. Oh, here we go, so I must be there, 27. So this is where I start to put in Oh, okay, I see. So I wanna skip at that point. So we are going up oh, to 2636, there it is, there. Okay, so at this point, I start to put in some of those sunflower petals. All right. That sense of depth. All right, I'm gonna play here and bring in some, some of what will become the sunflowers. In a moment, I'll point out a couple of things about this that are important to understand. You notice I'll get more quick and fluid as I go along. That was the first one, I'm getting a feel barely a touch of walnut oil. I think my lemon yellow is starting to get a bit weathered. I'm starting to get a feel for how I want to paint those petals. And so that first one is kind of my work out some of those kinks uh, flower or get it, get a good idea of how I want to approach it. Okay, so right there, and I, I reversed it because in the, in the video, I, I slow mode that brush stroke so that people could see it a little bit better, but we don't need to see that today. So uh, let's see, 2846, there we go, right about there. <clears throat> so um, one thing I'm, I'll, I'll, the uh, brush that I'm using is a Rosemary uh, Egbert, it's either the 2085 2085 series or it's the classic Egbert. Um, they're, I love both of them. The classic has some synthetic bristles in it. The 2085 is just pure hog bristle and I use both of them. Uh, in fact, it's probably one of these right here. So I use, a, uh, I use several, anywhere from a size zero up to about a, let's see, what's, up to a size six. No, what are these? This one is, I think that is a six. It looks a little bit like an eight, but I'm not really sure. So I use a whole range of them, and they're really fun for when you get want to have that that dancing movement with a brush stroke. So that's what I'm using a lot in producing the uh, all these strokes that you're seeing as I go along. Sometimes, like the middle part, that was probably with just something like this, or it's just a regular. Uh, this is an ultimate long flat, rosemary size eight, um, so probably a size six, or uh, the classic as well. So the classic long flat, I like the, so when I talk about long, I like the long because you get a much better spring with it, rather than the, if it's, when it's shorter like a bright, uh, or a regular f uh, flat, then the bristles are much stiffer because they don't have as far to move, and they're going to, when I'm using, when I'm painting like this, I'm really getting quite a bit of paint on there. And often this will, if it's too, too short, it'll actually come in and scoop off the paint that I've already put on there, rather than being able to do a, a nice little uh, 
spring with it. So I like the long flats as far as the, the kind of brush stroke that I can get from it. Um, okay, so we put in some of those and then right here, I'll show you a couple of more. All right, so that's probably enough of those. Let's go over here to 30, 29. Gently. Right in here. So what I want to, there's something particular I want to point out right here. I'll, I'll do this. I'll do one more little one next to it, and then I'll tell you what I'm doing here. Okay, do you see those those little strokes? Like right there, that little bit, and that little bit. So these might seem fairly uh, haphazard it, with the way that I apply them, but there is, when I'm putting in these, first of all, I wanna make sure that they aren't all done exactly the same way. There's no formula, there's, I don't wanna have repetition in there. I want, throughout the whole painting, for there to be a lot of variety and some little, some little uh, golden nugget that the viewer comes back and they go, oh, I didn't notice that before. Uh, it's because it's different from over here so that there's always something new to discover as they move around the painting. <clears throat> so when I'm putting in like a stroke like these right here, when I put in this big stroke, that outside edge right there as it moves away from the viewer, I want to soften that edge so that the, and it's just, it becomes natural after a while. Once you start to, to do this all the time, those little things will become second nat nature to you. Just like they have, uh, to a great extent, become second nature to me. All it is is experience. All it is is uh, painting these things uh, often. Uh, not just sunflowers, but anything. Just getting out and painting often. And especially out on location. Going outdoors, painting plein air. That's really going to uh, inform your understanding of atmosphere and edges and values and, and things like that. So that little stroke right there is just to soften that outside edge so it's not a straight hard edge. Because otherwise what happens is if I have a hard edge down here at the bottom and I have a hard edge up there at the top, then that flattens that shape and it pulls that shape up to where it's straight up and down and it looks like it's, there's, there's no depth to it. It's not rounding over, it's coming straight up like this and creating a wall right there. I don't want a wall right there. I want it to feel like that's, it's a round sunflower and those petals are pushing back behind. And just a little softening of that edge like that can help to accomplish that. Same thing down here, this was just a straight line, that was a straight line. To make them so that they are different from one another, the Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other, I want them to always be like that. I want constant variety. So I put a little uh, jog out right there on that petal so that it isn't like this side over here. I don't want those two shapes that are next to each other to be identical. Does that make sense? Okay. So now, a couple more little things I'll share with you. Uh, at 119. So here you can see, I'll, I, I'll show you just here as we move along, the kind of the progression of some of this. So I get to a certain point, putting, see the leaves are the same thing, just putting in shapes. And then I can start to refine the shadows and all of that sort of thing. Ah, that was one thing I was going to show you. Let me get over here to this part because I did put this in afterwards. Where is that at? Uh, enlarge the sky, skip, create the curving orange middle. There it is, 50-52. Ah, pretty close right here, 50-52. So this is where I start to add in not just, so on this one right here, like the, big, the bigger uh, sunflowers, I'm not just going to add in one dark spot in the middle. I also want to have some shadow underneath some of these petals 
because as they're uh, curving over like that, the reason why they're so bright is because they're catching the sun. And so I want to have some shadow in there, but I don't want it to be dark and dead looking. I want it to have some color to it. So I'm basically taking this kind of color and just making it a darker value in there or, or something that will give it some life and energy to it. Uh, okay, so you'll see me put in the, the shadows underneath and then the shadow in the middle, but I'm working, remember this is all, all a Prima, all of the paint is still wet. And I like that because I'm constantly using the wet paint around something that I put in to soften those edges, just like we talked about on that little sunflower flower over to the side. Um, something I, well, yeah, let's get to that first. So grabbing some quinacridone ro uh, red and some ultramarine blue, mixing those together because it is a darker lavender in there. So you'll notice I, that shadow was bigger than I, I wanted. I don't want to mess with that a whole lot. I, I like the simplicity of it already. And then there's... So do you notice when I put in that shadow, yes, I had more than I wanted in there, but did you see how easily I could take the wet paint that was around it and just grab some from over here and pull it across that to uh, make that shadow shape smaller. So that's the, that's the beauty of uh, Alla Prima. It really is fun to work wet into wet. A little bit of a dark middle area here. Let's see if I can get that in there without it becoming obvious to uh, too much detail for the simplicity of everything. Hopefully that'll work. So the brush that I'm using there is one of my old Asabi uh, 6158s. They were mongoose and they don't make them anymore. Uh, mongoose hair has become illegal for a good reason. Um, they were not commercially raised and humanely treated. A lot of times it was in other countries where they would go in and grab the poor mongooses and they didn't treat them well at all. So um, they've now mongooses were getting scarce because of that because of poaching they it was not a legal practice it was actually illegal but now mongoose is completely illegal uh, across the world so this is uh, one of the old mongooses i've changed those to something like this this is the rosemary uh, 274 and this is a bright but it's a softer hair rather than the uh, the bristle so uh, this is more of a bright. It's not the long flat. We've got the two different types with this master series. You notice here's the long flat and there's the, you know what, let me, I should probably let you see this up big. So we've got the, the long flat and you can see the more the short flat or the bright right here. And this is the 279. This is the 274 series. And these are great for just coming in either this or around. It doesn't really matter. Whatever works. But I like the Often I'll grab one of these even though it's a flat because I can use the corner and the edge depending on, like you saw with that one, um, that one shadow, how I wanted to pull some paint across it. Well, that's where the flat comes in handy rather than around because I can grab some uh, with the whole edge here and pull it across in a very soft way. I don't want to dig into that paint. I just want to softly take some of the lighter paint and pull over that shadow to uh, modify it. So those are the, that's the difference between the long flat and something like a short flat or a bright. All right, so let's get back to the video. All right, so let's see, where, where else are we going here? So you've, you've basically seen how I approach the middle of that. Let's get to the 
the highlights on this as well. So what, I, what happens here is in, in that background area with the flowers, I actually have my wife come in periodically and critique my painting. So with her looking at it, that helps me to, um, I get blind spots when I paint. I, I've been painting for, for over 30 years, but I still get blind spots. I get enamored when, with some certain area and I'm so taken by that, I don't even notice that I've got some other really glaring uh, problem in another part of the painting. So she comes in periodically, looks at it and gives me some, helps me to, to pick out those places that I've become blinded to. Generally speaking, I turn around, I look in my mirror, so that, because that changes the perspective, that changes that image that we develop in our brains. When we develop that image in our brains, when we've been working on it for a while, our brains are really good at taking something that isn't working and making it work even though we haven't changed it. In our mind, we've changed it because in our mind, we, the mind kind of, kind of wipes it off of there so we, we really don't see it that well. Uh, so turning around and looking in my mirror, that disrupts that image that my brain has formed and helps me to see it more fresh and anew. Or I step way back in my studio, I can get back about 20 feet or more in my studio and then I can see it uh, from a distance and that gives me a good idea of how the different value shapes are working together. Do they feel disjointed or is there a nice flow in the painting? So, um, which brings up another thing about when I talked about I'm not going for an exact replica of this, of my uh, reference image, I also have my monitors, I have two computer monitors where I put my images up, especially if they're uh, like, um, I have photographs or something like that that I'm working from. And they are uh, 12 feet from my, from my easel so that I'm not seeing little tiny details all through there. I don't want the little tiny details. I want, I want the overall filling, the overall, um, movement, the overall design, but not necessarily all the little images. If it's something specific like an iconic uh, piece of architecture or something like that, then I'll walk up and I'll uh, figure out what's important in there. But otherwise, I really don't care about the very specific details that are in there. Okay, so uh, as we scroll along, so now I'm going to show you how I come in, she, she said that this was just, uh, what I'm going for here with something like these flowers right there, I want them to, uh, here and there, to have some of those flowers, but not everywhere. I don't want that kind of activity all the way through there because then it gets busy and I don't want to sit there and put in all those little details. Not necessarily that it's bad, but it's just not my personality. So I want to give the feeling that this is a field full of things like this without actually putting in these all over the place. Um, but right now it doesn't have that feeling. It's like these are all the sunflowers right here and then this turns into like grasses or something. It just doesn't feel quite like um, a field of sunflowers that is uh, a ways from the, dis from the viewer. It feels more like just grasses or something that are out there. So I want to bring in more of that feeling of sunflowers everywhere in it. So this is how I do that fairly quickly. Um, let me get you to where you can see that. Okay, so I, I do vary things up. I added a little bit of uh, CAD orange to the mix. For the most part, the paint in here, I'm using almost straight CAD lemon with maybe a touch of CAD uh, yellow medium. Once in a while, I'll add a little bit of white, but generally speaking, it's mostly just CAD lemon straight from the tube. Uh, and with just touches here and there, depending on how I want to get some variation or fluctuation in the value. So, uh, same thing, I add some CAD uh, orange into that mix. Um, I can add other colors into it just to vary it up a little bit. And that's what I'm doing out here. The reason why I'm using lavenders, is be especially this particular reddish lavender, is because it's a really harmonious kind of color with the yellows. And I want to get that mix of cool and warm colors as it, uh, throughout the painting. That's what these blues are for. Um, all of these things in here are to give a mix of warm and cool. If I have just yellow everywhere, it's going to be way too warm. Okay, so I get to, let's get to where I start putting in the real strokes of <coughs> color in there. Or the, with those flowers back in the distance. Okay, so here's where, and, and I decide I want to have some plenty of texture with it. So you notice this here is a bristle brush. 
but it's one of those Egberts. It's a size, I guess it's a size six, it looks like right there. Size six Egbert. Uh, they're a lot bigger than um, they look. To create some or than the size light and dark areas. And I can utilize some of this to also help create some more, the feeling of more individual sunflowers, hopefully. Okay, so from a distance, I already like all of that a whole lot more. That light that it brought into it. Greater feeling of contrast. Now I need to get some shadows in there as well. Okay, so you notice how once in a while I do a long stroke of color with, with plenty of texture, paint texture in it. And sometimes I do a little bit like that. These little bits, when I put them in there, I'm, look, I'm watching for some of those little bit darker accents or value shapes that I put in there and I'm just thinking about the structure I'm thinking about three-dimensional structure so in, in some places I'll go and just put in what might seem like these the highlighted petals around a middle area on that flower and then other areas I want to have to where it's just a, a group of flowers where you really don't see the middle very often it's just a bunch of those flowers out there and all that texture gives us the idea of flower petals and other things that are in there without having to put in every little bit. It's, it's more the feeling of it, the expression of it. Okay, um, let's see, a little bit more. So then I start to come in with even more, here and there, a few little spots of those uh, dark, dark uh, dots. When I'm putting in those dark dots, I don't want them to be everywhere and I don't want to get to where I have just a straight line all the way across like this. I want to make sure that they are varied going up and down that they have fun movement to them. All through the painting I am thinking about variety and making sure I don't have lines anywhere that that are even if they're just implied lines I don't want those lines that create a distraction or create some kind of repetitive motion in the painting. And let's see, uh, at 137, where are we at now? So, we're, and then 138, 59. We're almost there. Okay, 138, 59, right here. This is where I put in the highlights on those. And it's, it's mostly cad lemon with just a touch of white. And so you see what that... If I had started with white in there in the beginning, it'd be really difficult to come in with the really bright highlight parts on that. But starting with the paint straight from the tube, that gives me a much better middle value, a light middle value to work on top of. So there we get those little petals that were sticking out to the side. I put those in there. I just didn't put each little individual one. I got more of the feeling of that happening there. And I vary it up all the way through here. I'm, I'm trying to think in terms of, I don't want it to be the same everywhere around in there. I want it to, uh, just in spots. So really that comes down to where is the sun? Where, where is my light source? And what's it going to be hitting on? Uh, and so I'm getting the top, the top little spots on here where the sun is really going to hit on those and, and brighten them up. But not everywhere. If I put it everywhere, then it loses its effect. It's not nearly as powerful uh, when, it's, when it's spread out all the way across the painting. If I have it in just a few spots, then my eye, the viewer, first goes to this flower because it's bigger and uh, because of that contrast that's there. And then I start to look for other flowers like that and it helps to lead me or the viewer through the painting. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking to lead the viewer all through the painting and not just, uh, and not everywhere. I don't want the viewer to get lost. I, I want to guide the viewer. I'm the tour guide, basically for the person that looks at the painting. All right, and I think 
let's see, creating, uh, that was, so there's a fun little spot. Oh, this is something I wanted to point out. So <clears throat> let's say that we're, we're doing something like this. We're putting in all of this, like these highlights on the top of the flower. And we feel like, you know what? It still doesn't have as much contrast as I would like it to have. Well, I don't want to add more white to it because then it's just going to get um, cold. White is not a color. White doesn't have, it's, it's a reflection of all color. So there's really no color there to look at. I want it to be colorful. So I don't want to keep adding white to it because that's going to uh, cool it down. White is overall a cool color temperature. And I want these to feel warm because it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly sunny day. The sun is coming in here. But also, um, there's only so far you can go with white before you just have pure white on there. So what can we do if we want it to feel brighter, but we don't want to keep adding more white? This is what we do with that. And that is, where did I have to go? Oh, I already got there, didn't I? Is this where it is? Right here. Nope, this is not it. Where'd I go? Uh, Sorry about that. It is right here, 140, 52. Oh, 52, almost there. Right here is where I show you that. Okay, so you notice that is not actually, let me pull this over here for you to see. That little, whoops, that's why I didn't, what, didn't want to use that one. <laughs> it always puts, pulls that down. So that's, uh, there's really nothing there. There is no dark behind this flower right here. That's something that I decide the painting needs, not because the reference photo said that it needed it. So if we go back now, I wanted that in there, but it wasn't in the reference photo. That's why we don't want to become a slave to our photo. We want to be the master of it here. We are the ones that we're the creative um, intelligence behind what happens in this. It's our own personality, our own experiences, and really that's what we're sharing with our viewer. We want the viewer to feel what we felt when we looked at it, that initial joy, the excitement, the, the wonder of it all. Um, and so <clears throat> to, for me, I decided that I wanted to have that brighter and the way I knew I could get it brighter without losing all the color in it was to put something darker around it. So those are some of the little things that we can do to really bring life and vitality to our paintings. So, and I think that now I, now I'll share that some other time. Let's see. And I think, oh, so, uh, one thing about painting a la prima that's really handy, and I'll show this, this will probably be the last thing I show on here, is uh, that sky back there. I knew I, was, I would have a frame on it and it would take up you know, an eighth, probably a, about an eighth or more um, off the sides, all the sides. And I, I wanted to have um, a fairly small sky, but then I realized that the shape of the orange uh, grand land that's back there and the shape of the sky were basically about the same size shape. So I wanted to vary those up and I decided that that, that purplish lavender, that, uh, sorry, that bluish lavender that's back there would probably be the better option to bring in more sky and a little bit less land. So in doing that, if I go to 155. With, when you're painting a la prima, you can do that very quickly and uh, beautifully because you can take and blend things together. And so I love painting a la prima because of this. It's just uh, 155 straight up. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna try bringing this guy down some. Christy, thanks. It'd be nice to have a little bit more of that blue in there. So let me try it out and see. I think that's a lot. 
lot darker. Yep. Significantly darker. And this is how I get my values. It doesn't, I don't necessarily look at it and know right off the bat exactly what value I want, but I can just keep playing with it. And when it's wet into wet, I can keep working into that and it's no big deal. Oil paint is very forgiving. It is an, an amazing medium to work with. Once I start going, once I, when, once I get the rhythm, once I get the value the way I want and all of that, I can really start to move fairly quickly with it. It's just that initial getting the, the colors and values the way that I want them to be. And when I pick up other color on there, I make sure that I wipe that off on my paper towel before I go and put down another stroke, for the most part. See, that, that one I determined was just in the way. So you can easily just <laughs> remove it. Wipe right over the top of it. Nothing back in there is that important, except for the design. I, ha I want to make sure that I get the design interesting. Part of that is the paint texture. I love paint texture. That's one of the things I love about oil paint. I can get nice and thick with it. Mm, too much. And I'm constantly varying it up. I don't want it to be the same from one side of the painting to the other. Because the sky isn't the same from, from one uh, part of the horizon to the other. It changes as we go along that horizon line. It usually goes from uh, light to dark or from uh, cooler to warmer, something like that. It does change from one side to another. So we want to have kind of that same idea when we're painting the sky. We want to make sure that we're getting some variety in there all the time. Okay, so that's probably enough. You got the idea of how that works. And let me bring in once more the final paint, uh, painting so you can see how that worked out. You can see all the paint texture back in here that I leave in there. Now, if this paint texture, if I felt like it was detracting from this up here, then I would smooth that out. I would make sure that it wasn't nearly so textural. I want to make sure that the textures all throughout the painting actually contribute to the harmony of the whole. I don't want to have texture back there just because I like paint texture. I want to make sure that it fits, that it feels like it belongs in with the rest of the painting. So that area back there, there's not a lot going on. So for me, that texture helps to give some interest back there without pulling too much attention to the back area. I want the viewer to go back there and have something interesting to look at, but not so much that they feel compelled to keep looking at the sky rather than at the flowers. I want to make sure that the flowers always feel like they are the most important part of the painting. So you can see all it, these layers, there are layers of, of value in here, <clears throat> but really they're very quickly done. There's nothing, it doesn't have to take uh, an eternity <laughs> to, to finish a painting like this and still get that feeling of lots of sunflowers all in, in, a, in a big field. So hof hopefully, let me get back here. <clears throat> So I hope that helps you. Uh, a few tips there uh, about painting sunflowers in a field. All right, so get out and paint your own sunflowers and have fun. Happy painting. <laughs>